Pulmonary embolism can be a life-threatening condition. However, immediate treatment can be life-saving, and preventative measures can help reduce your risk of ever getting it. We'll talk about the signs, symptoms, prevention, and treatments for pulmonary embolism on this week's Health Talk. We're up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Vicki Smita. And I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today we're going to talk about new treatments for pulmonary embolism as well as some of the old treatments. Our guest is Dr. Jonathan Bowman. He's a vascular surgeon with the Vascular Experts of Southern Connecticut Vascular Center. A lot of vasculars there. <laughs> yes, Welcome absolutely. to the show. This is your first time, Jonathan. Yes, right? thank you for having me. Thank uh, you for joining you. us. Appreciate and it. pulmonary embolus, that's mm -hmm. a mouthful, and it's uh, pretty scary for those of us in the field that uh, have taken care of patients with it. Tell us mm -hmm. what it really is. Uh, pulmonary embolism is essentially when the uh, blood vessels going to your lungs have been blocked by a, by a blood clot. So what it does is it deprives your oxygen or it deprives your body of oxygen, and therefore you kind of feel some shortness of breath, some chest pain. And it kind of has various um, stages. You can have very small ones that maybe you never even notice, all the way to uh, life-threatening uh, blockages of these blood vessels. Yeah, so this is what people generally refer to as a blood clot to the lung. Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. I think most people have heard of that, and it is quite common, and I think it's even more common than we make the diagnosis for. It. Yes, it's quite common, about 600,000 cases per year diagnosed. Um, and it's actually even more co common than uh, breast cancer wow. as far as a diagnosis. Men versus yeah. women, any predisposition one way or the other? Uh, there's really no predisposition. It can affect either sex about the same. Um, you know, it usually starts when, um, it usually starts with a blood clot in your legs. Actually, I was just going to yeah. ask you about that because uh, th those are, they're directly connected. These blood clots don't start in the lung. Right. Like a heart so, attack starts right. in the heart, these blood clots start in the legs. Absolutely, and the biggest risk factor for that is going to be um, essentially immobility. So people that have been on uh, long car rides, uh, long plane rides, especially people from this area. Especially if you're uh, flying economy where you're... <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Like that. And that's long plane flights, you know, people flying across country, people flying to Europe, that sort of thing. I actually read an interesting yeah. study that, that where they used highly sophisticated methods to test for early blood clots in the legs and mm -hmm. some astounding percentage, I don't remember whether it was 20 or 30 yeah. percent of long distance travelers, three or four hours, had yeah. those early blood clots. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of, uh, probably a lot of people out there that have blood clots that are never really uh, symptomatic or meaning, or you know, they never really know it. And they could even have a, a PE and never really know it. The pulmonary embolism. The pulmonary embolism. Um, the biggest, but when people do um, have symptoms or know they have a blood clot, usually what it will be is um, a new kind of new leg swelling, new leg heaviness, feeling that your leg is tired or in pain. And those are the sort of symptoms that you should really uh, start thinking about seeing your And maybe doctor. emphasize, it is new. So many people have low-grade leg swelling on both sides, especially as they right. get older. If they've yes. been on their feet all day, pregnant women, that doesn't mean a blood clot. Necessarily. True. No, usually it's something that's different from your normal routine. Like you said, I mean, a lot of people do have leg swelling, you know, at the end of a long day after they've been on their feet. This is right. not quite the same. This is going to be something that's really different for you. And especially focused. one side versus both Yeah, it'll both usually sides. be one side versus, or it'll just be one side. It'll yeah. be painful. Um, it'll be a definite change uh, in your Sometimes you can health. even see yeah. the veins yeah. of your legs dilated compared to the other side. Absolutely. So yeah. it, it uh, but it can be a difficult diagnosis to make. Uh, yeah, sometimes it can because there is a, definitely a spectrum, you know, it's not everybody has terrible leg swelling and pain. It can be that, you know, just you may have a little bit, um, especially people that, you know, do these long, long flights, long car rides, that sort of thing. It can also be that if you have people in your uh, family that have been on blood thinners or have been diagnosed with a blood clot in the past and you now have new leg swelling, that's something you definitely want to you know, yeah. see your doctor about. So, so you want to see your doctor, if you have mm -hmm. leg swelling and it sounds very much like what we're talking yeah, about, swelling, yeah. should, should you go to your doctor right away? Should you go to the emergency room? Is this an acute yeah. emergency that you need to seek help for right that minute? Can uh, it wait till the next day? How mm -hmm. do you usually counsel patients about that? Um, I usually counsel people that if they really have new leg swelling and they really have uh, been on you know recent plane rides, car trips, they should really either, if they, they should see their doctor that day so they can get into their doctor's office a lot of the 
you know, family doctors, internal medicine doctors now today, they have access to ultrasound, which is a way to diagnose. Yeah. Um, and if that can't be done, you know, in a timely fashion, then they should go to the ER, in emergency room. Yeah. Because what you're really trying to prevent is you're trying to prevent that clot from breaking off and spreading and then Absolutely. going to the lungs to cause a pulmonary embolus. Right. Absolutely. Which is the life-threatening part, generally, is when the <laughs> yeah. clot right. breaks off. Absolutely. So if you have, so that's one thing we want to prevent. So that leads us into that if you have a blood clot in your leg, we want to basically start you on blood thinners so that your blood will become thin and the clotting will stop and your body will start breaking down the clot on its own. Because the sooner we start the treatment, uh, the more likely uh, your body is to do that. You should probably um, mention a couple of other things like surgery, yeah. particularly orthopedic surgery, yes. you have cancer. Uh, yes, there's yeah, many other things. So uh, people that have been in the hospital for a long periods of time that have had major surgeries like uh, you know hip hip replacements, knee replacements, they're also at having a, they're also at an increased risk for this, and um, you know those patients are a little bit more challenging because if, especially if you had surgery on your leg, your leg's going to be swollen anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes that is. Um, you know, something we have to be vigilant about and make sure that they see their orthopedic surgeon or uh, someone else sooner. And, pregnancy, and in, you were yeah. asking about women before. And pregnancy, but pregnancy. before we even yeah. get to that, I wanted to talk, going back to patients who've had surgery, yes. now the new standard seems to be that any type of surgery, anybody who's had any type of surgery, if you're spending the night in, your, in the hospital, yes. you get certain devices placed on your legs. Do you want to talk about those, the uh, antithrombic yeah. uh, I'd say over the years, because of this uh, blood clots leading to pulmonary embolism, which can be life threatening threatening. Um, there's been a lot of uh, research put into to preventing these blood clots, especially with orthopedic surgery. So while you're in the hospital, you actually get a uh, blood clot usually injected into you. Sometimes they even give it to you to take home. And also they have uh, special um, devices that you can put on the leg that actually squeeze your leg and push the, right. keep the blood circulating. Maybe right. you could say right. a few yeah. words on that because I think a lot of people don't understand the difference yeah. between the arterial and the venous circulation. Sure. So maybe we give our viewers at home uh, a little anatomy lesson and why sure. do these clots form in the legs and why do they end up in the lungs? Um, so basically you have, you have arteries, they come right off the heart, they're high pressure, that's supplying all the blood to your muscles and tissues, so that's kind of basically pushed out, that's what pulsates when we check a pulse. Mm -hmm. The veins, however, are taking all that used blood, so once all the muscles and the cells use the oxygen, the veins take the blood back, and that's what we call a low pressure system. Um, and the veins are very plentiful, but the problem is when you have a low pressure system, um, if you're not moving, like contracting your muscles, uh, the blood can become static and or it can right. slow down and because it has really to move against that gravity back to the heart. right that's yeah exactly right. so it has to it has to pump against gravity so if you're you know sitting down for long periods of time or you're in a hospital bed that sort of thing the blood becomes static uh, or becomes slow and then it can clot off right. And yeah, it's so. almost a passive movement. There are valves in the veins right. that, keep it from backflowing. that keep it from backflowing. Right. So when you squeeze your legs, when you move right. your legs, that squeezes the valves yes. or squeezes the veins. The blood right. moves up right. and then it can't flow back down. But if you didn't right. move your muscles, like if you're lying in bed or right. if you're right. paralyzed, yes. uh, there is essentially nothing pu uh, right. pumping that blood back to the heart. That's right. And then we, ha we do have uh, some diagrams that we could bring up that may yeah. make this a little clearer to people, especially why it goes to the lung sort yeah, of magically. So tell, John, tell mm -hmm. us about what we're looking at here because I know we're looking at the lungs in a cut off version of the Absolutely. heart. Absolutely. So that's uh, essentially your lungs on either side. There are two bags basically filled with air. In the middle is the heart. You have a four chamber heart that basically is pumping the blood around the body. The chambers on the right are sucking blood in and the, cha the, the chambers on the left are pushing the blood out. So the blood clot is this kind of very small brown thing that you see at the bottom of the screen in the blue tube that's coming up through the vein. Uh, it can go into the right side of the heart and be pumped into the lungs, where normally that blood would go to the lungs to get oxygen. Um, however, that little clot is going to block up those blood vessels and make it so that the blood can't get oxygen, and therefore... And you see that yeah. on the bottom part of that lung where it's not getting that's blood right. flow. That's right. It's going, the little, the little beam there is going into the lung, and that's kind of where it gets blocked and off. You can sort of see that darker brown area yeah, on the lower exactly. right, which yeah. is the injured lung because, the, it's, because not it's not blood getting blood in it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the, this I know is a, is a diagnostic picture. So Sure. So after, uh, if, you go, if you go to the emergency room, essentially after we've, we've done ultrasound of your legs, we found you have a blood clot. If you have chest pain, shortness of breath, um, we'll probably get a CAT scan of your chest to see if you actually have blood clot in your lungs. So this is a picture of a CAT scan. And what that is depicting there is basically a blood clot in the the arteries going to your lungs. So it should be where that arrow is, that should be white. 
uh, a very bright white like you see in the other part of the blood vessel, blood vessel, but you can see there that that has a nice dark line. That means that blood is not flowing in that area and therefore your body is being deprived of oxygen and that's part of your problem. And th this is sort of a nice, this is as if is a, uh, a magician cut, cut the right. person in half. That's right, that's actually looking at you if you were from the feet up. Um, and you can kind of see on the bottom right hand screen, there's a line across, that's actually an x-ray right. of the chest. You can see that line is where that's the outside there, is. the very bright things we're looking at are the, the ribs yes. and the vertebral body, body right. then the very dark areas of the lung, and then that yes. central mass is the heart and the major blood vessels. Exactly. Uh, let's look at the next one. Yeah, this is now cut in the other direction, as if they sort that's of right. sliced you from the top of your head down to your, uh, down to your feet. That's right. So that's kind of looking at the, the what's behind the heart. And on either side, you have the lungs, which are filled with air. Those are the black spaces. And then the, uh, the kind of the white lines that look almost like tree branches. Those are the arteries that should be uh, bright white. And that's what the is indicating is the blood. And the dark spots that the arrow is pointing to, that is, again, where the uh, blood vessels are blocked. Yeah. So, the, so the dye is not getting right. into those. So yeah. this is a little bit more subtle than on the first picture, but it's just, nevertheless right. the same phenomenon. And you can see those sort of darker gray areas. That's right. quite a large embolism, isn't yeah. it? So that's, not so that's subtle that's for a large. vascular surgeon, but yeah. definitely right. <laughs> no, right. Yeah. That's yeah. very large, okay. yes. Yeah. So, so this is the way a diagnosis is actually made when someone goes into the emergency room. Yes, or, yes absolutely. So we'll basically, you know, the doctors will look at you, look at all of your symptoms. Um, they will probably, again, get an ultrasound of your leg if you're having leg swelling and pain to see if they if you actually have a blood clot in your veins. Then if you do have problems with shortness of breath, chest pain, difficulty breathing, uh, they'll probably progress on to this sophisticated study called a, a CT scan or a CAT scan. Well, we may point out that in elderly patients, uh, mm -hmm. manifestations may be a little bit different. They can be confused, they can have neurologic Tired. signs, they, yeah. right. uh, so, yeah. so it's, it's, they may have a seizure. So, uh, rapid pulse subtle. rate is very, very common as part yeah. of pulmonary embolism. Yeah, a lot of different things it can be. And basically what it is is your, the, the, your body is being deprived of oxygen. So that can be your brain, that could lead to the confusion and the seizures, uh, or, or your, your heart muscles is the most concerning thing, and that's why you would get some chest pain and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, sure. yeah. But there is, this is a, a, a disease we've known about for a long time, mm -hmm. and there's a lot we can do about it. And Absolutely. that's what we're going to talk about when we come back, and it goes all the way from magic medicines to uh, magic surgery. <laughs> and so, so I want to thank Jonathan, and okay. uh, we'll all be back after this short break to give you all the good news. Hi, Vicki and I are back with our guest, Dr. Jonathan Bowman. We're talking about blood clots in the lung or pulmonary emboli. And uh, we, we didn't talk about one important area, I think, right. of risk. Uh, and you uh, started risk. to ask about it earlier, but I, I think it'd be good to talk about women and their mm -hmm. risk factors, women on oral you know, women get so many advantages from their estrogens. You have right. a lower risk of heart yes. disease for 10 years. You'll look younger. Right. You'll look great. But, but, not, but not here. But it does cause. It does come for the price. Cause, <laughs> estrogens do put people at risk for blood clots. So maybe we could say a yeah. few words about that. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, recently we've seen a, a number of uh, younger uh, women that have, been, have started uh, oral contraceptives or birth control pills uh, that kind of in that initial stage when they start, they're at a little bit higher risk to develop a blood clot. Um, and they're also more of a higher risk if they are starting their medicine and then you know, do things that cause blood, th blood clots like going long car rides, long plane trips. Smoking, perhaps. Smoking, right. uh, you know, being, having major surgery, that sort of thing. Um, so even young women, I mean, I'm talking you know, teenagers to college age women, if they have start to have these symptoms of you know, leg pain, leg swelling, something's not quite right, you know, they definitely need to, to come in and be evaluated because they are at a, uh, at a higher risk as soon as they start the, that treatment. Right. Maybe we yeah. should also say something about long plane rates and car rides because yeah. there are things you can do to, to <laughs> mitigate right. or eliminate yes. the risks. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. Just because you go on a long plane ride doesn't mean you have to develop a DVT. So things I usually recommend to my patients are 
uh, wear, get a pair of uh, support stockings or tight socks that and helps keep the blood. And that's actually been proven to work. I'm amazed with it. That's actually, right. they yeah. looked at it and it works. Yeah, kind of compress those veins. You know, if you can, get up every hour, stretch your legs, walk around. Uh, if you can, if you're, you're stuck, back in, uh, stuck back in coach, you can just kind of con constrict your calf muscles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've done, I've done that your, myself. Uh, just ankles. Either, yeah. you know, moving your, as you said, your feet back and yeah. forth or sort of doing toe raises with your... Yeah. yeah. Anything you that pushes to, the yeah, blood back up. You just want to up. keep the blood, blood moving, basically. Cars, you should yeah, stop and get thing. out every couple of hours. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Around. Yeah. And so stay well hydrated. That's another one. Absolutely. On planes, you tend to get yeah. very dehydrated because of the low humidity air. So... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So all those things can help you prevent it, you know, and then be aware if you do have the symptoms that you need to see a doctor. So, so. switching gears then, okay, mm -hmm. so we've diagnosed or we think we've diagnosed somebody who's at risk or who might have yeah. these findings, whether it's leg swelling or mm -hmm. um, chest symptoms. Mm -hmm. What happens to them at that point? What, what, what sort of treatment options are available? So once, once we uh, determine that that is the cause of your, your symptoms, we want to start uh, basically a blood thinner. And what a blood thinner does is it actually, it doesn't actually break down the clot. Right, which it is a misconception. That, right. Absolutely right. It, it actually prevents you from forming a new clot. Your body actually makes a, a substance, we'll call, it, we'll call it TPA, that actually breaks down the clot. So once we give you those blood thinners, it allows your body to break them down. You know, and that's, I think huh? that's a really right. important point because people don't right. fully understand that the body can break these clots down right. as well as form clots. And in fact, yeah. the coagulation right. system is usually a balance between the things that cause clotting and break them down. So if we Absolutely. can reduce the tendency to clot, the body will generally dissolve a lot of these clots both in the legs and the lungs. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's essentially the gold standard for treatment. And the majority of people, if they take the blood thinners, uh, in about three months' time, their they're kind of shortness of breath and their leg swelling will diminish. Um, for people that have really severe symptoms or they have pictures like I, like I showed you earlier where a, a really large clot burden and their heart is strained, we actually have a new procedure where we actually go in with a very small catheter through one of the veins in your groin and we put a small catheter inside of the clot and we actually inject synthetic TPA, what, uh, what is Which actively is clot, break. clot buster. Clot I mean, buster, that, that yep, it, we inject it right into the blood clot over 12 to 24 hours. And um, what that does is basically it allows you to recover sooner. So the patients that we've treated with this, uh, with, with pulmonary embolism, with this uh, treatment, you know, by the next day they're no longer needing oxygen. Mm. Uh, they can get to go home. They are basically able to return to their normal activities a little sooner. Whereas patients that just get blood thinners, um, you know, may take the, they, it takes they'll probably, yeah, it takes a little bit longer. They may actually reach that uh, state, um, but it just takes a little longer. So we're actually able to re return people to um, recovery a little sooner. So you talking about this, and not to make light of, uh, of, of mm -hmm. the disease process, but it sounds a lot like plumbing and Drano, right? You put like, Drano into plumbing. the clot and yes. you get the clot to break down. Is, Am I oversimplifying uh, no, this? No, I think it actually it is, it is a pretty, pretty <laughs> yeah, this simple is a process. I mean, it's really neat it, yeah, that you it, can it, get in there. Yeah, it is. It is very. It is like plumbing. This and, is like uh, a snake with a with some Drano at the I end of that, it, right? That's the visual exactly. I'm getting that's right, right now. <laughs> yeah, this is. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, yeah, we're basically just going in and dissolving the clot, and um, and I think we're improving, improving people's outcomes with that. Now, that's not for every, Not everyone needs that. Yeah, the, right. um, you, you alluded to it, but maybe you could right. say a few words. Small yeah. clots to only a tiny section of the lung. Sure. They can usually be treated effectively yes. just with blood thinning. Absolutely. We're talking about large clots where the heart is really. Right. not able to pump enough blood right. through the, the vascular bed of the lungs. Absolutely. If you have a very large clot, so much so that you're, you are requiring us to give you oxygen through a, through a mask, through a tube, that's usually when we consider this. And also we can see on the CAT scan, it's hard to say, but we can see if the heart is having trouble actually pumping blood. Right. And those are people that really benefit from this. But the large majority of people you know, just get starting on blood thinners is going to be just fine for them. What happens when that larger clot starts breaking off? Are there any mm -hmm. risks associated with that? So now these little pieces are breaking mm -hmm. down. Are they completely getting dissolved? Are they going off to other parts of the body? Could potentially cause problems elsewhere? Um, that's a good question. It usually doesn't cause problems elsewhere. One, the smaller that they get, the more blood flow that can be pumped into the, the more blood that can be pumped into the lungs and therefore more oxygen. So now we don't usually see any any problems. Um, okay. you know, uh, the, pretty much everyone does, does well. I mean, the only problem we have seen is if the blood clots have been there for a long time, like greater than two weeks, the, the medicine will not break it down. Then you won't see an improvement. Uh, because sometimes yeah. that clot begins to scar over 
Right. And so it hardens, right? It hardens, yes. and, it, and yeah. you, you don't get a clean resolution of the plot. Right. You basically get a healed over scar with holes in it. That's right. And that's why that's, that's an important point is that if you have these symptoms, you need to get started on treatment early. That's the best way you have, or the best, uh, best way you have to bre actually break down the clot. Or either we can do it manually, or your body can break it down. Right, because otherwise, otherwise we're talking about going in and doing something a lot more invasive. I mean, to the point where you might actually have to go in and, and, right. and do an open surgery to get rid of that clot yes. if it's really hard. Yeah, very, very, very rare, but there are people like that out there that have needed that. But that's exceedingly rare. That's well, the exception. Yeah. Well, sometimes you guys, meaning vascular surgeons, <laughs> yeah. will go in and actually rotor rooter out the clot in the leg or yes. give uh, yeah. Such clot Such technical terms drug. that we're using. <laughs> right. Well, I'm doing it so people <laughs> understand. It's, <laughs> right. it's a lot more expensive than a snake. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yes. but, but uh, so people, there's been a more increasingly mm -hmm. aggressive approach to clots in the leg even before yes. they break off the lung. Maybe you could say a few words about that. Um, you know, we do do that uh, now, and that is because what we found is that if you have a particularly large clot and you come in and your leg is very, very swollen and painful, um, number one is, you know, if we're able to get rid of that clot for you to manually dissolve it, you will feel better and be returning back to your normal activity sooner. The other thing is that because, uh, as you mentioned earlier, veins have valves in them, sometimes this blood clot can stick to the valves and it may not get completely dissolved by the body with blood thinners. And therefore, in the long term, you may actually get some uh, leg swelling that lasts. It may well be as bad as it was initially, but it'll kind of never be the same. So we found that by sometimes attacking these blood clots early with the rotor-rooter treatment, basically dissolving them, that we can diminish the chance of that and hopefully make it so your leg stays normal. Yeah. Now, a lot of people are told to take blood thinners yeah. for a very long time after they've had a blood clot, mm -hmm. particularly a, a big one. Yes. Um, again, would you say a few words about that and why, why this preventative therapy should be continued for so long? Well, we think that um, once, once you've had a blood clot, your body, the, the chemistry in your body is probably prone to forming blood clots again. Um, so we like to, con like to, one, keep the blood thinners going to make sure you don't form any new clots, to, and uh, number one, to make sure you don't form or, and to make sure the blood clot you have gets appropriately dissolved. Um, and then at the end of that time, you know, we can look for uh, someone if you have a particular, if you had a good reason to have a blood clot, either, you know, again, long plane rides, you, were, you had a major surgery, you, had a, you were in a car accident in the hospital, something like that, then usually we can stop the yeah. blood thinner. But if we don't find a good reason for you to have a blood clot, there are people that are predisposed. Then you uh, stay on it for stay a long on. time. We'll stay on it, we're, we're referring to a, you know, a hematologist. Uh, to really look at your history. There's some uh, laboratory tests you can, um, you can have that may indicate if you're predisposed to developing a blood clot. And there are a lot of new blood thinning medications available. Absolutely. Coumadin or Warfarin used to be right. mm -hmm. almost the only one we would use long term and it was oral. But you'd have to check levels all the time. Yeah. With levels still and still it, right. it interacted with food yeah. and medicines. It right. was very difficult to give, although we really understand it quite well. Now, there, just if you say a few words now about the, uh, the new inhibitors that are on the market. Sure, yeah. there's been several new um, medications that have come off of the market within the past couple of years, basically, that um, are supposedly taking the place of Coumadin. As you said, the main problem with Coumadin is that, well, number one, you have to have your blood drawn every week or two weeks to check the level. Right. Uh, two is it's very, the level is sensitive to what foods you eat, like salad and alcohol, things like this. The newer medications, though, um, you don't have to have your levels checked, and it doesn't matter what type of foods you eat. Now, there, the one potential downside is that Coumadin is, when you come to the hospital, it's reversible. We can give you a medication to reverse it. The newer medications are essentially are not reversible, but they they're out of your system within the 12 to 24 hours. So it's a little bit of a little bit of a trade off. And, right. so. and I think a lot of people are uh, that trade off is a difficult decision for a lot yes. of folks. They are developing though uh, reversers for these uh, new advanced blood blood thinners. Yes. So when they come on the market, it'll change. It's also yeah. a lot more expensive. Of course, <laughs> so everything we, we have, new is more expensive. Yeah, of course. Yeah. If it's new, it's right. more expensive. Absolutely. We know that. So uh, that's all we have time for this great, great conversation. When we come back, we'll answer this week's health questions. But right now, let's take a look at some of our upcoming events sponsored by Western Connecticut Health Network.
What are the risk factors for pulmonary embolism? That's our guest question, and mm -hmm. we've got the expert. So please review for our folks at home. Sure. What are the risk factors? The risk factors, uh, the risk factors for pulmonary embolism are also, I'm going to put them into uh, the same classes with a deep vein thrombosis or a DVT. So that's going to be um, basically if you're um, not moving for long periods of time, either a long, play ride, long plane ride, long car ride, if you're in the hospital, uh, if you've had major uh, orthopedic surgery, uh, 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 hip replacement, a knee replacement, if you've had some sort of trauma, either a car accident or maybe a trauma to your leg, you know, you were in a bike accident, something like that. Um, if, you're, if you have a family history of having blood clots, your brother's sisters, mother's father.